certainly aware that you did not come here to hear or see me, that you came to see Mr. Clive Barnes, so I will keep the introduction to a minimum. Um, accompanying, or prior to the time that Mr. Barnes arrived, the inevitable press release came, which tells us things about his background, his education, and his mother is even mentioned. It seems to me that in a situation such as this one, you, knew, you know who Clive Barnes is, or you wouldn't be here. He knows who he is. Uh, so I need no, not, <laughs> I think he knows who he is. Uh, one doesn't usually drop in on such a discussion as tonight on the basis of, I wonder what's going on in the sunroom, I'll look in. <clears throat> I will say that Mr. Barnes is speaking on the plight of the theater today, tonight. I believe he's going, <laughs> comma, tonight. I believe he's going to feel some questions. You are aware, I hope, that he serves the dual role of dance and drama critic for the New York Times. Uh, I could go into his background, the business of Oxford, and so on and so forth, but I will simply introduce him in the following statement, because I had the good fortune of picking him up at the airport today and found this to be, in my own perception, rather than some press release, to be the case. Uh, when Mr. Barnes was appointed to the dual position, the dual assignment of dance and drama critic, the following thing was said by Clifton Daniels, the Times managing editor. He's an intelligent, perceptive, well-informed man who writes very well. He's knowledgeable about the arts, including theater. And aside from that, he's a nice fellow, and I find that to be the case. Mr. Clive Barnes. Thank you. You know, I always remember, I was once in introduced uh, by someone, uh, and they said, uh, who needs no introduction? And after, after the talk, two, 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 two women came up to me and said, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you know. <laughs> I also, also remember, I had a very, very distinguished predecessor, much more distinguished than I am, and who was much more square and uh, uh, much more kind of what one would expect the New York Times critic to be if one expected a New York Times critic to be anything. And uh, he, was, he was Brooks Atkinson. And um, once... I, I used to teach at NYU in the uh, Department of Journalism, I think very heavy, uh, and I used to teach critical writing until I decided you couldn't teach it. Uh, at least I couldn't. <laughs> but anyway, um, but there was a, uh, Adam and I a kind of meeting, a fraternity kind of, it was the journalism thing, and I was being introduced by the, uh, well, there's a new play uh, from the Texas Trilogy in, in New York called the, the Oldest Living Graduate. Well, this one was older. And she was about, oh, I don't know, 98, 99. You know, she was, you know, in good shape for someone in 98, 99. And then suddenly, when she was introducing me, it became apparent that she wasn't, she didn't really know who I was, and she wasn't introducing me. She was introducing Brooks Atkinson. <laughs> no, this is it's true. And this was, this was uh, everyone was kind of appalled by this, and they didn't know whether to stop her, to let her go, to apologize to me. And the, the wavering voice went on, and it reached a kind of climax when, when she started to, to uh, say, you know, how much you are missed, Mr. Atkinson, and that your, your successor <laughs> is, 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 is so awful. And <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so um, <laughs> what I'm talking about tonight uh, is uh, I'm not talking about the plight of the American theater. The American theater is absolutely, absolutely great. I, I, I'm reminded of, of, of Time magazine sending to Cary Grant uh, a telegram once, how old Cary Grant? And Cary Grant replying, Cary Grant, uh, Cary Grant perfectly <laughs> splendid, how old Time magazine? Uh, and um, uh, I am not, in fact, the American theater is indeed perfectly splendid. What I'm talking about really is the plight of Broadway. Uh, the American theater is not Broadway. Uh, more members of Actors' Equity uh, work out of New York than inside New York. Uh, even the New York theater is certainly not Broadway. There are about 340 theaters in New York, of which only, I suppose, something like, uh, 
Incidentally, I'd better warn you, uh, when I use statistics, I make them up. Uh, but, 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 but uh, because I, I, I find that they're like telephone, uh, they're like telephone numbers. They're, they're not worth, they're not worth lumbering the mind with. And, and anyway, I have a bad memory. But I, I want you to know also that the statistics are very much in the right direction. They're, they're not downright lies. They're, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're just, they may not be accurate within, say, 20% or so, they're, that kind of margin of error, but they're, they're okay. So. Now, there are 340 theatres in, in New York. I hope that gives you a comforting feeling of confidence. And I suppose something like, uh, I think only about 40, probably less than 40, are in fact Broadway theatres. The other theatres come under four categories, Broadway, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, and what can be rather dauntingly known as the institutional theatre. There, there, that sounds rather grim, but that's what it is. Now, these titles, Broadway, Off-Broadway, and Off-Off-Broadway, they sound uh, as if they are comforting, the comfortingly geographical. They are not. They have nothing to do with geography at all. There are only two Broadway theatres on Broadway. There are about three Off-Broadway theatres on Broadway, and there are quite a number of Off-Off-Broadway <laughs> theatres on Broadway. These, these titles uh, refer entirely to the... Uh, Return, uh, refer entirely to the um, union deal and uh, the union status of the theatres concerned. The Broadway theatres have the, the they, they are the large theatres, the, the big showcase theatres, and indeed these are the theatres that the world thinks of uh, as the New York theatre, uh, perhaps decreasingly so nowadays, but and it's certainly the thing that most Americans think of as the American theatre. There are not many tourists, for example, uh, who would think of going to the theatre in New York and not think in terms of Broadway, unless they happen to be theatre buffs or have a, a specialised theatrical interest. So, but one of the things I want to explain to you tonight is that the Broadway theatre is getting increasingly less important. Off-Broadway is... Off-Broadway was a move about 30 years ago to try to break through the uh, restrictive costs of what even then were becoming the Broadway theatre. And for a time it did, but then once again the unions moved in to this situation uh, and um, unfortunately uh, the off-Broadway theatre has now become almost as, in, almost as expensive as the Broadway theatre and because of its very limited seating capacity uh, there isn't a Broadway, an off-Broadway theatre that is larger than uh, 399 seats. Uh, as a result of this, uh, off-Broadway is almost out of the issue. It's almost ruled itself out as being uh, simply uneconomical. The off-off-Broadway theatre is something interesting. Uh, this is the new off-Broadway, and it's, they are always by professional actors, uh, but they are professional actors that, for some reason or not, don't get paid. Uh, they sometimes, if they're lucky, they get ca car fare, and if they're unlucky, they walk. Um, the standards vary, but they are often extremely high. Uh, they, these are theatres that some of them are very tiny. They're storefront theatres. They're in attics. They're in basements. Some of them are extremely beautiful. Uh, some of them are, are even are even elegant and lush. But most of them are are yeah, small theatres. Some you may, some you may itch to get in. Some you may itch when you get out. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they are, but they do have uh, an Im increasingly important part. They fall into two major categories, uh, which are what are called the showcase theatres. These are where actors' equity have given permission to for the actors to appear uh, for an, uh, a number of performances, a limited number of performances. Usually. It's 10, I think. And um, this is to give um, a new player a chance to, get, to uh, enable actors to ply, uh, to ply their trade, to uh, give a, uh, agents and um, um, producers the possibility of seeing this work and these actors. It is, as it said, a showcase. The other kind of off-off Broadway theatre is where uh, the people don't care about that. They don't. They may be members of equity or not, but what they are really doing is they are moonlighting 
in a, a professional sub-amateur position. And uh, some of these will be classic theatres. Uh, most of the classic theatre in, in New York is provided by Off-Off-Broadway, interestingly. And some, some will be doing modern plays. Some of them, a lot of them, will probably be doing modern classics, often modern European classics. The institutional theatre is perhaps the most interesting of all four. The institutional theatre is probably the future of uh, the New York theatre and the future of the American theatre as a whole over the country. The institutional theatre is non-profit making. Now, in actual fact, you couldn't have anything much more non-profit making than Broadway. The Broadway is as non-profit making as a race ho uh, 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 as, a, as a horse race, um, because uh, very few plays make a profit on Broadway. Very few indeed. It's possible for uh, a musical such as Irene, which I always like to think of as No No Irene, uh, to play <laughs> for for um, more than a year on Broadway at enormous rates to break every house record Broadway had known up to that time, and that was in the days before Porgy and Bess, and uh, or the days before this manifestation of Porgy and Bess, uh, and, uh, and still not pay a penny back to its backers. Uh, it lost everything, uh, and yet it played to capacity for um, more than a year. And they call that, it, uh, there was, sometimes they call it a business, sometimes they call it an industry. Uh, I, I, I don't think the captains of that industry or the owners of that big business are very smart sometimes, although the captains and the owners do, in fact, do quite well. Uh, it's only the backers who don't do so good. Now, the institutional theatre is, is meant to be non-profit making. It is non-profit making by charter, and it uh, is up for subsidies, and uh, it is uh, the equivalent of or the beginnings, the, the, the germs, the seeds of our own national theatre. And it is not just in a building, it's not just one place, it's all over the city, it's all over the country. That will eventually be our particular American version of the national theatres that they have in Europe. And this is important to, to my, in, in my book. Most, the most significant work in New York is being done by Joseph Papp's uh, American Shakespeare Festival. Uh, Joe started giving free Shakespeare in the parks to, to keep everyone happy and to cool, uh, cool down those hot uh, summer days and stop, stop race riots. Uh, which is why the grateful, uh, grateful municipal government w provided him with subsidy. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, it's the only time people can go into Central Park and not, and not think of Johnny Carson. But, um, but um, the, he, he has expanded enormously from that, and now he has a, a very wonderful complex of theatres uh, in downtown in Lafayette Street in the, in the village, uh, in which I think, I don't know, at the last count, I think he had about six small theatres there, and that some of them are very beautiful. It was in the old Astor Library building, which the, the uh, city built, uh, uh, bought from him. He got, uh, he has acquired, he, he's, he's a great manipulator of things like money, <laughs> and, uh, he, and people. And he, he, acquired, he acquired this somehow, and uh, eventually the city bought it, and, he, and they maintain it, and he pays a dollar a year rent for it. Then other, he also has the Vivian Beaumont Theatre uh, in Lincoln Centre, and underneath it the, the uh, Anne Spacker Theatre, a small theatre underneath the Vivian Beaumont. That's two theatres in Lincoln Centre. And of course, he transfers a lot of his productions, such as Chorus Line and uh, the play about coloured girls, which is very fine, but I can never remember its title. Uh, coloured girls who have considered suicide but found the rainbow was enough. Uh, it's a difficult title to remember, uh, but catchy when you get the swing of it. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he also has a number of successes, such as stream at the moment, Streamers and the Thropany Opera. Both of those are at Lincoln Centre. Now, other institutional theatres are Ted Mann, Circle in the Square, which does it sings as Vanessa Redgrave in Lady from the Sea, uh, Ibsen the um, Lady from the Sea, does a lot of very fine plays. Did a wonderful Uncle Vanya quite recently with George C. Scott and Nicole Williamson. Does some very important work, does some bad work, every theatre does. And it does about, uh, it does in, indeed, it does in entirely four, four plays a year. 
Another institutional theatre, not so good but trying, is the Roundabout Theatre, which specialises in unusual classics. At the moment it's doing George Bernard Shaw's The Philanderer, which hasn't been seen in, in New York for more than 70 years and is... I don't think New York has missed much in the, in the <laughs> interim, but nevertheless, it's an interesting play to do. Uh, and there, the, there is the Negro Ensemble Company, uh, which is doing some extremely interesting new black plays because the black theatre has become one of the most vital elements in the, in the American theatre now. And then there is the... Um, uh, I always forget theatres when I try to reel them off, but there is the, there is the Chelsea, Chelsea Theatre in Brooklyn, uh, which is also a, a major, a, a major theatre. It, it produces some remarkably interesting plays. It specialises in modern, Euro in, in modern European plays, which otherwise probably would never be seen in New York. So these these are the the important theatres. Now, what is happening to Broadway? What is the plight of Broadway? Well, this is very simple. This is the most glamorous part of the theatre. Uh, it still is, there's no doubt about that. And Broadway at its best is still absolutely magnificent. And also Broadway helps feed the rest of the American theatre. And it does do things at, uh, any, at, at, with enormous skill uh, at, its, at its best. But the difficulty is that Broadway has become increasingly over the years extraordinarily expensive. Why? The two obvious reasons. The first is that the, it happens, these theatres happen to be built on uh, the most expensive bit of dirt uh, the world has ever known called Manhattan Island. Uh, I don't suppose it's not dirt, I suppose it's stone, lightly encrusted with, with pollution. But, um, <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, this is very expensive real, real estate. It would be cheaper to pull all these theatres down, for the owners to pull them down and to build in their place, I don't know, high-rise massage parlours or something like that. <laughs> it would, it would um, it, or even office blocks. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much demand for office blocks at the moment <laughs> because um, it, 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 business and industry seems to be deserting New York. Um, the, other, the other thing is the unions. The unions are very tricky at this moment. Very often my, my microphones go dead. But the, 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 unions, the unions are a very uh, a good stage hand at the Metropolitan Opera House can earn $1,000 a week. Uh, a bad stage hand at the Metropolitan Opera House can earn $1,000 a week. Um, and sometimes they get it for playing poker under the stage. Um, in fact, uh, in many... In many places, uh, the, the, with the mechanisation of the of the stage, you know, and the, these these kind of things. The, the I mean, for example, in the Eisenhower Theatre in Washington, uh, really one man, can, you can have you, you. They have a system where they can have six sets all put up at once in various parts of the stage, and you can press a button, and these sets just move into one set moves off, and the other set moves in. Uh, so really, stagehands are only needed to come in and put the and put the set together and maybe keep it dusted. Uh, but um, that's all they're needed for, and yet uh, they are extraordinarily expensive. So this is um, a certain difficulty. I'm not against unions, incidentally. I always I have to say this. I mean, I'm I, I, I uh, I'm a socialist, so I suppose I'm to the far to the left of unions. But um, I, I don't. Um, I'm not against them, and I, I, I respect their rights, but I do, uh, I do resent, in certain areas, the, their, their further bedding um, processes, which uh, you know, are not helpful very often, especially in such areas as the theatre and in, in, in newspapers, two areas in which I happen to <laughs> try, be trying to make a humble living. So... <laughs> um, what has happened is, on Broadway, has become this incredibly high cost of tickets. I mean, I, I don't know whether any of you visit New York with any regularity or whether you intend to, but the one thing I warn you is, don't worry about being mugged in the street. I promise you, you won't be. You won't see any violence. 
uh, you know, uh, you won't, well, I mean, I say that and immediately you get there, someone will hit you on the head. But, um, uh, but I, have never, I have never witnessed violence in New York. I've witnessed it in London. I've witnessed it in Salt Lake City. But I have never witnessed it. It's true. It's true. My first day in Salt Lake City, I saw a mugging. I, I, people are not going to believe this, you know. I mean, uh, weird. Um, uh, anyway, don't, uh, uh, in, in, I, have seen, I have seen people shooting up heroin in, in, in Trafalgar Square. I mean, uh, you know, I, I just live on Manhattan's west side. I, I live in a nice, nice neighborhood. I mean, what is this? Um, <laughs> But anyway, I, you won't be mad, but you will be shattered by, by, the, by the cost of tickets. I mean, in fact, you may even have to start mugging yourself to get in. <laughs> I, in fact, I often think a lot of the violence in Manhattan is caused by, by distray theatergoers tr from out of town trying to <laughs> prey on other people to, to get the money to, to go to the theatre. Anyway, but and for most people in New York, the, it's not just... Uh, the cost of the tickets, because nowadays uh, we have what is euphemistically known as an inner city problem. Uh, I've never quite known what an inner city problem was, but what it seems to mean is that um, the only the rich and the poor can live in a city with an inner city problem. The, the middle classes, such as myself, although I have to cling on somehow and, and starve, uh, the, 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 because I, I, you know, I couldn't do my job unless I lived in Manhattan. But the, for most people, most ordinary middle class people, it's almost impossible for them to live in Manhattan. And it is from these people that the theatre going uh, strata of society traditionally comes, for the most part. And therefore, most of them live outside. They live either in either in one of the one of the other five boroughs, or alternatively, they, they live in the suburbs in Long Island or wherever. Sometimes in Jersey. So they have to come in. They're commuting. If they have a babysitter, they have to come in. They have to have a meal. If you're paying up to $20 a ticket, you're not going to eat, eat in McDonald's. And uh, a price, a reasonably priced dinner for two in New York nowadays it can easily be 30, 35 bucks. Uh, and then by the time you, you're making a night of it, so you have a, a drink on the way home, the whole package comes up to something like $100 for most young couples, I would say which is considerable, it's like a capital investment. One, one, can, imagine the, one can imagine the wife asking the husband on, on Monday morning, shall we go to the theatre on Wednesday or shall we go to the Bahamas for the weekend? <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's tough. Now, what has this meant? Uh, it's meant that you can be very, very successful on Broadway, but you cannot be moderately successful. It's meant that the big hits are very big and the small hits are closing. Uh, this is really important and dangerous for Broadway because what the creative artist has had removed from him, like the carpet under his feet, is the most important freedom uh, that an, any artist can have, the Im most important freedom that any artist must demand, and that is the freedom to fail. Uh, this enormous structure, this enormous uh, arcane structure has meant that the artist does not have that vital freedom so that he can repeat himself, he can try to repeat other people, he can try to be the second Neil Simon but he has difficulties if he wishes to set out to be the first Joe Bloggs and this is to my mind very unfortunate and very, very sad. Now, there is other, other effects of this, side effects. One is the new importance, the growing importance of critics, uh, which is very bad. Critics, I once, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I took part in an in a interesting uh, television debate on, on Canadian television with Sir John Gielgud to the proposition that critics should be horsewhipped. Uh, I, I took the line that not even horses should be horsewhipped, but I'm a very peaceful person. But, um, uh, 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 and in actual fact, I won. At the beginning, they have a kind of count, and 30, 30 people thought critics should be horsewhipped, and 30 people thought they, they shouldn't. Uh, after the debate, 
Uh, 41 thought they shouldn't, and only 19 still, still uh, thought they did. Actually, those 19 beat me up after the performance, <laughs> so, so I, it wasn't all that much fun, but still. <laughs> um, but there is no doubt that in New York, in general, and in uh, America as a whole, we do give too much credence to critics. We, 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 uh, we treat them wrong and we read them wrongly. Uh, we, 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 uh, we do not uh, treat them as uh, bridges between the artist and the audience, uh, advocates for a certain kind of theater. Uh, we don't treat them for as people trying to give insights or people trying to not give an objective opinion. There's no such thing as an objective opinion unless you're, unless you're God, Moses, or John Simon. Uh, they're, they're, you know, that, they're, you, but um, certainly um, what the subjective opinion can be fair and it can interest people even if, even if it can give you an idea of the play. Criticism is the cheapest publicity. Uh, the theater can get, or any art form in a way. And I feel that this is a very valuable function. But unfortunately, when the theater costs so much, when the Broadway theater costs so much, people tend to use the critic as a kind of judge, to use him as uh, a racing tipster, to use him as good housekeeping seal of approval, which is quite the wrong way to treat criticism. It, you should be much looser and freer in your way of reading criticism. Don't take it for granted. And this is, this is a, a great, great pity. However, uh, we uh, don't have to be too depressed because while Broadway is uh, only a, a shop window rather than a laboratory, while it has lost its function as the dynamo, the driving force behind the American theater, and I think it has, it can still produce some extraordinarily interesting work. But it is always work that has not, or almost all, always, work that has not originated on Broadway. It is work that has been brought in from, from somewhere else. It may have been polished, it may have been slightly changed, it may have been adapted, but fundamentally it has, it has come in, it hasn't originated there. I mean, for example, the greatest, the biggest hit musical, uh, in fact, perhaps it will be, make more money than any other Broadway musical, it will make more money than any other Broadway musical in, in living history, is A Chorus Line. A Chorus Line did not start on Broadway, it was, it was originated off-Broadway off in the institutional theater in Joe Papp's public theater. I doubt whether this could have been done on Broadway had it not been done in this for a long time in this workshop situation for a long time before. A recent musical, we don't know whether it's going to succeed or not, it opened last Saturday, it's called The Robber Bridegroom, which is a kind of country and western musical, it's great fun, it got wonderful notices. This was a classic way of how Broadway is getting over its troubles to produce products. It started in a, in a laboratory showcase to which critics were not even invited. Uh, John Houseman, who is the director of the acting company, and uh, saw it, liked it, took it to uh, Saratoga, to the Saratoga Festival last year. Then he brought it to the Harkness Theatre later on, just about a year ago, and now in a different production with different actors, been slightly tarted up a bit, but looking actually better than it did before. It has come to, it has come to, to Broadway. This is the pattern. People ask why there are so many British shows on, on Broadway. Uh, the answer is very simple. Uh, so many of these shows are of great quality, but they have been developed uh, in, the America, in the English uh, institutional theatre, the National Theatre or the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. They have been paid for, subsidised by British taxpayer money. And, uh, and they come, they come to, to Broadway as finished products. I mean, for example, think of a play like Tom Stoppard's travesties, and think of trying to get uh, backing for it, because, you know, this is the way that producers produce plays. They go to, they have auditions, or they send around scripts, and they're asking backers, they're called angels, because no one will fear to tread with them, and, uh, or on them, and, uh, and um, they, they 
are uh, they have to go to these backers, these angels, and they have to tell them what the play is about, and they say, you know, will you put in $10,000, $20,000, whatever. Now, imagine going on the subject of Tom Stoppard's travesties. Imagine going to these backers and saying, I've got this very funny play by this man called Tom Stoppard, uh, who's a Czech Jew who happens to work in England, and this is uh, fascinating. It's about a minor British consul official in World War I in Switzerland who happens to be, get involved in a production, an amateur production of the importance of being earnest and loses his trousers and he's very upset about it and he meets, and he meets Lenin, Tristan, Tristan Zara and James Joyce. I mean, the, the only reaction to that can be, who on earth is Tristan Zara? And, uh, <laughs> and, or imagine uh, going out and trying to get money for, for uh, Equus. You know, there's the, this really fascinating play. It's really interesting. It, it, it's all, it's, uh, well, it's about this boy who blinds horses. Uh, and, uh, yeah, with a, with a stake. Uh, and, uh, yes, he does do it on stage, yes. And uh, <laughs> people will love it. There'll, there'll be, there'll be uh, oh, actually they could say, oh, by the way, there is a nude scene in it. Well, anyway. Um, but you do see that this is one of the reasons why uh, with uh, a London production, or with a production out of town. For example, Shenandoah opened at the Godspeed Opera House, so did uh, Going Up, an a, a old revival of an old 20s musical about the early days of aviation, which is quite fun. Both of them are originated out of town. Uh, most of these shows do originate out of town, and I don't mean in the old way of the out-of-town tryout, the traditional Broadway pattern of uh, <coughs> taking taking a play and, uh, you know, opening it in New Haven and practically closing it in Philadelphia and struggling through to Boston, making changes as you go away, firing people and doing all that. The art of the theatre. Uh, I, I'm always reminded that, that uh, Bernard Shaw used to, uh, well, once asked, he had a director-producer called Gabriel Pascal who made all Shaw's films, I think, uh, Pygmalion, Major Barbara, Caesar and Cleopatra. And uh, once someone asked Shaw how he got on with Pascal, and Shaw said, not very well, not very well. All, all Pascal wants to, wants to do is to talk about art, and all I want to do is to talk about money. <laughs> uh, well, so far we've been talking about money, but we ought to, we ought to um, talk a bit about, about art. Um, part of the future of the theatre uh, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, uh, consists in the need and the understanding of the need and the, and the meeting of that need of subsidy for the theatre. Um, we need money. We need handouts. And uh, we have to get them or else we give up our theatre. But the future of the theatre in its own right is something, is something ra rather rather different. Um, I think at the moment we have an astonishing number of young American playwrights uh, and a lot of them are, are extremely good. Uh, they are different from the old traditional playwrights. People talk about the good old days in the, in the uh, American theatre. The good old days were pretty lousy. Uh, I was once for my sins, uh, or perhaps not for my sins, uh, asked to, uh, do, uh, to provide an anthology of the best hundred American plays from 1900 to 1950. Well, I tell you that once you get up to about number 17, it's rough going. <laughs> and, most of, and most of the 17 are, are, either, are I, I, either by Eugene O'Neill or, or Tennessee Williams. So uh, it's, it's really rough. Most of those plays uh, are, that, were, that were keeping Broadway alive were things that would nowadays either be uh, in, you know, they would be on television. They would either be, these people would be writing for Kojak or, uh, or Norman Lear or Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Uh, it, it was a double program. But um, the, 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 these now, these are really pretty much hack writers. I mean, Lillian Hillman, who, I, despite scoundrel time and all that, was not a particularly good playwright. Lillian Hillman, uh, were, she, were she writing today, would be alive and well and working happily for, uh, for television. 
Uh, and indeed, uh, most of the playwrights of, the, of, this, of this period would be. And indeed, that kind of playwright is working for television today. The, but there is the emergence of a new, new playwright, new young playwright, who is attracted to the theatre for a number of reasons. In the first place, I think that uh, between the wars and immediately after the wars, I suppose the idea of, of every young American of literary talent or, or at least literary aspiration would be to write the great American novel and then turn it into the great American screenplay at an enormous profit. Now, I think that nowadays, uh, in the first place, young writers, unless they have a very special uh, ego wish for it, are not much turned into the novel because the novel is a very hard form to make a buck from. Uh, and professional writers, even professional writers, like to eat. And um, it's very difficult, unless they can get a university job uh, to support themselves or something like that, uh, it's very difficult to make a living as a novelist. Screenwriting is something else that is no longer so attractive as it was uh, in the years immediately before and immediately after World War II. I think the reason for this is that with the uh, much more the, uh, what has been called the auteur theory of filmmaking, which has had a very wide effect all over the world, uh, I think it is becoming increasingly obvious that the creative force behind a film is the director and that the screenwriter only, can only have a break if he can direct his own film, which is why people like Woody Allen, I think, do direct as well as write their own films and play in them. Also, uh, he gets three times the salary. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm always reminded of, of, his, of his definition of a, of a, of a bisexual, with someone who, 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 ha who, had a, who has twice the chance on Saturday night. And um, so he does get three, he has three times the chance with, with writing, writing, acting, and, and directing his own movies. But I think for a lot of, of playwrights, they have uh, moved away uh, from the screen, they have moved away from the novel, and they are now very interested in the new form of the theatre. I say new form of the theatre, and I'll tell you why I say that. I think that for many years, it has become apparent that the, uh, the, the cinema first and later television can in many ways do better and certainly do more economically and bring to many more people what, exactly what the theatre was trying to do. Who wants to go to the theatre and see a bedroom farce or something like that when it won't be as well done as a, as a black and white rerun of I Love Lucy to be seen at four o'clock on your home screens any, any convenient afternoon? Uh, there is no reason to pay $100 to see something that is no better than I Love Lucy, and a lot of these plays uh, were no better. It's the same as the such uh, imaginative forms as the, as the Who Done It. Nowadays on Broadway, really few people are interested in who 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 done it or who did it or who will do it. Uh, there is, it, it's it's a form that has lost its its interest. Now, if you if you remember, the theatre does learn sometimes, and it is learning to reevaluate itself to look look at its at what it's what it's made of. I like to think of a comparison here with the art of painting, and sculpture for that matter, the fine arts, and the impact of the photograph. Now, the photograph, we, before the, the, the uh, coming of, of photography, um, most painters uh, regarded the, their prime function as that of making a li holding a lively mirror up to nature, making, making a pretty much a realistic, a realistic genre theme of, of, some, of some nature. Slowly it became apparent that the, that the camera could do that more effectively than could the painter. And slowly, I think this it was the reason why, the painter realized that he had to provide something different. 
And we first had Cezanne with Impressionism, and then the Post-Impressionist, then all that, all that followed the move towards abstraction, and now maybe a re reaction from abstraction. But the freeing of the painter, the artist, from what might be called the literal image. And it seems to me that something like that is happening in the theatre. The theatre nowadays, uh, the new plays being written, do not have that firm narrative uh, framework that was so characteristic of the plays of the 30s, so characteristic of the plays of the 40s. And this is something very new, particularly, I think, in the American theatre. Because remember that in the American theatre, we were still waiting for Lefty while everyone else was waiting for Godot. And, uh, and the realism of the American theatre is something which, is, which uh, now, curiously enough, only finds its place, its, its valid place here in, in, in the black theatre. Uh, I think the reason for that is, is fairly simple. I think that the black theatre still has uh, a conscience, a, a, a sense of, of, uh, of political of, of, of political anxiety. It has stories that it can tell, uh, which the white theatre doesn't seem to have. I'm, rem I'm reminded that um, some time ago, when, when our buses in New York can't, can't persuade anyone idiotic enough to, to uh, buy an advertisement and take, and take their chances with the graffiti, uh, they put on advertisements themselves, kind of public, public health or public you know, announcements. And I remember some years ago, uh, we had an announcement which, which many of our buses carried saying, remember, in the ghetto it is still the 1930s. And I think this is very true, and I think this is why that realistic strain of drama still maintains itself in the black theatre. Although not entirely, a lot of, a lot of black writers are uh, moved right away from, from, the, from the sense of realism into poetic drama. Now, what is happening in the theatre is obviously the... Uh, the uh, theatre is becoming much less the kind of narrative form that you find in television or films. And obviously, uh, the theatre is trying to do things now for the first time, things that television cannot do. At one very basic level, it's using dirty words and nudity. Uh, at a more subtle and more profound level, it is accepting its role as a, an elitist art form, rather more like opera than like television. And it is trying to use that, it's trying to make very considerable demands on, upon our intelligences and our feelings. And I think a lot of what is happening is extremely rewarding and extremely interesting. I also think that another very good thing that is happening in the, in the American theater is our new awareness of the need for a classic theatre. Once upon a time, uh, I always remember Broadway, uh, uh, the Variety uh, would, uh, would announce, it would say there is a, re there is a revival of Hamlet. It, it would, everything, the whole classic theatre would be called revivals. And it is constantly um, said that revivals seem to be, are thought to be bad news. Uh, when people ask me questions, they always say accusingly, but isn't Broadway full of revivals these days, as though that is, that is something somehow discreditable. There is nothing discreditable about a revival, whether it's a, whether it's a revival of a classic or the revival of a modern classic, uh, whether it's a revival of, of, of um, a, a play by Sheridan or whether it's a revival of, of a play by Tennessee Williams. There's nothing discreditable in it at all. If you haven't seen Hamlet, then to you, Hamlet is a new play. And it would be absolutely unthinkable uh, for the, um, say, the American concert scene to exist as, for years, Broadway tried to, with music that had only been composed, say, in the last five years. Or imagine what would happen to our opera houses if they only performed operas that had been performed, uh, that had been written in the last five years. This I can only say cult of the new in the American theater is thoroughly unhealthy. Now, what we do need on Broadway, in New York, everywhere, is a very strong classic repertory company, classic company. 
curiously enough, one of the very best uh, is on your doorstep, if you count 400 miles your doorstep, in Minneapolis. Now, that is a theater, at least it was the last time I saw it, that uh, exists and is probably better of its, of its kind than anything we have in New York. And I think it is very healthy. It's bad for New York, but it's very healthy. We do need a strong classic theater. And there are many people who are now moving around trying to build one. And of course, uh, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, we are fortunate enough to have a regular sort of relationship with the Royal Shakespeare Company in London, uh, which does come every, nowadays it seems to come every year, briefly, but at least it, it comes and gives us some taste of, of the classic theatre. Personally, I do not like growing up in a town where my children cannot see uh, the really best of the theatre of the past, both in both English language and, and foreign theatre in translation, uh, in the way that you can in almost every major city of the world. I think this is a deplorable lack on the part of New York City, and something which is partly the fault of the public, partly the fault of directors, partly the fault of critics. Critics have been very rough on attempts to build up a uh, national theater. They have been the first to, to scream and shout and say, well, this isn't very good, is it? Look, it's not as good as the Royal Shakespeare, or it's not as good as Britain's National Theater, it's not as good as the Comédie Française, it's not as good as the Berliner Ensemble, which shows a great deal of their sophistication, uh, and, and, also, and also their travel allowances. But it doesn't, <laughs> but it doesn't actually help the cause of the, of the American theater. No one is asking them to say that it is as good as those old and venerable institutions, but uh, it would be a lot better if they tried to point out what was there rather than what they think should be there. And then what they think should be there might arise in 20 or 30 years. Merely by clobbering a newborn infant because it's not even an adolescent is not really very smart. So far, we've talked about the, the ordinary theater. I say we've talked. You haven't said a word yet, but I mean you will. <laughs> um, so far, um, I love that use of the word we. It's always a great, a great kind of thing. Um, so far, we have talked of the, um, the uh, more or less the conventional theatre. But I, one thing I see in the future of the theatre is I see something emerging that might have very little to do with the modern theatre, with the theatre as we, as we know it, or as we think we know it, and I think might have something to do it might indeed be a new theatrical art form that would have some of the elements of a theatre, just the same as dance has the elements of theatre, uh, opera has the elements of theatre, but would be a different kind of theatre. I think that this is perhaps needed because of the uh, great difference in our society and the overwhelming and rapid changes that have taken place in our society over the past few years. I want to, you to think, if you will, of three dates, 1916, 1946, and 1976. You'll notice that all three dates are split by 30 years. Now, in 1916, I think it would, been, would have been possible to have postulated 1946. Uh, the Wright brothers had done their thing uh, already uh, atomic research was, I think, f far enough advanced to postulate the, the fission of the atom and the, and the uh, um, <coughs> atomic bomb. Uh, the uh, motor car had been invented. Uh, already the, the, the war, which in Europe was two years on, had started the new technology of, of what was happening. Uh, it was quite obvious, radio was you know, tel telephone, even television was beginning to be, to be postulated, was beginning to be envisaged. So I don't think there's any very much difference. And also, there wasn't, apart from uh, considerable uh, social turmoil, it was social turmoil of a political nature between the, between the wars. It was not social turmoil of what you might call a sociological nature. It wasn't a social turmoil that suggested uh, <coughs> a, new, a, new, a new fabric of life, a new way of pattern, a new pattern of life. Now, in 1946, I don't think even the most brilliant futurists 
could really have judged or foreseen 1976. Uh, no one could have foreseen what the real impact of, of the jet would have been, a time that people uh, judge uh, distance not in terms of miles but in terms of dollars because you can be anywhere in almost any time if you have the cash to pay for it nowadays. We really do have a global village. Uh, I can, I mean, my children, for example, do not remember the first time they got on an aeroplane and they get on aeroplanes as if they were buses. I can remember the first time I got on an aeroplane. I certainly would. It was a bomber. You don't forget those kind of things. <laughs> but but, but um, I, I, you know, I, I view aeroplanes in a quite different way from the way my children do. I can remember seeing, be, first seeing television. Uh, I didn't think it would catch on. Now, uh, no one, no one, uh, very few people here can remember. See, very few, no student can remember seeing television for the first time. It was Marshall McLuhan uh, who first pointed out the new television generation in a book uh, called Understanding Media. Uh, it was uh, a book uh, dedicated to the proposition that no one could read anymore. Uh, it was very successfully dedica dedicated to that proposition because no one could certainly read that book. Um, <laughs> I, I think I got to page 58. I once met someone who got to about page 74. <laughs> but this didn't matter because Marshall McLuhan's ideas were so evidently right. I mean, to be perfectly honest, er er earlier generations never read Freud or Marx, well, a few nuts did. But, uh, but normally, uh, ideas that are so self-evident and so, and so self-evident they affect, they, they affect the, the current thought of the time are, are so self-evident that no one actually reads the ideas themselves. That you absorb them like osmosis in the air. And McLuhan's point that there was a difference between, between a generation that uh, found television waiting for it when, it when it got by its crib, when it got back to the... To the um, from when he got back from the hospital, is indeed self-evident. I see it in my own children when I was teaching. I saw it in my students. Uh, I notice what my children can do in front of television. I, I'm, I, I think it's extraordinary. They can do homework. Or at the one time, they can watch television, do homework, fight, hold a conversation, eat a meal, and listen to rock music. Uh, now, I couldn't do that. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it shows a kind of a diversity of mind uh, that I can only admire. Mind you, they can scarcely write their own names. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, I've never seen them read a book apart from anything that has been set to them by their teachers, but this doesn't matter. They can certainly know how to watch television. Now, I think that... Um, there are one or two things that, that television watching uh, has done to people. I think that it has, uh, what, um, what McLuhan pointed out, and I think it's perfectly true, is that uh, all our art, th th there was the linear structure of the sentence, and almost all of our conceptions of art were based on that. A sentence is uh, a means of communication that has a, a middle, a beginning, and an end. These are not exactly McLuhan's thoughts, either. Uh, these are a kind of idiot gloss on them. But a sentence has, the, the phrase linear, linear, linear form is, is McLuhan's. Uh, a, a sentence is, is, a for, is, is a means of communication that has a middle, a, be, a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, so much of our other uh, forms of art are the same as this. We, we think of a play as having a, 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 a beginning, a middle, and an end. We think of a film as the same. Even our, in music, our, our concept of sonata form is very much based on the idea of a, of a, of a sentence. I think even our, our feel in art for balance and form and shape is also, in a way, linear. Now, it's quite obvious that television is not a linear form. It bombards the mind with images. It, it switches from one thing to another. It, 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 it flashes. It, it, it's television in its purest, and to my manner of thinking, its most interesting form, which is the television commercial, uh, is... Um, now, I really mean that. I one day would like to have one of, those, one of those things, one of those... You know what they are. I don't know what they are. You know, the things that you sit 
sit in, uh, sit in an armchair, slowly getting sloshed and turning channels, uh, or, or just turning off the television set. I would like one of those so I could turn off the programs and just watch the commercials, because I enjoy the commercials so much more than the programs. I think they're much more artistic and they're much more interesting. But they are also, if you notice, much more visually aimed, and they bombard your mind with these images. And we are growing up with... Uh, we either have bombarded minds ourselves or we are growing up with our children who have bombarded minds. I have never seen more bombarded minds than my children have. And um, this is neither good nor bad, but it's certainly different. And it has changed our minds on form and structure. Someone once asked a French film director who I, I really feel, I think it was Antonioni, but I'm not sure. But someone asked someone, one of those could have been true for one of, one of those kind of fancy French film directors. Uh, and uh, someone asked him, should a, should a movie have a beginning, a middle, and an end? He said, absolutely, definitely, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and I, I, think that, I think that we are we are now moving into that way of thinking about the arts in many other ways. Now, the other thing I want to talk about and its effect on the theatre is this fact of the, of the fact of God. Um, uh, despite uh, the, the uh, Democratic candidate for the presidency, and I suppose the Republican candidate for the presidency, or does he have it? Uh, but um, w w both of them uh, seem to talk a lot about God, and they may well bring a religious revival and appoint Billy Graham vi vice president or something. Uh, but I, at the moment, there does not seem to be a great deal of religion in the country. In fact, it is interesting that we seem to be forming uh, the first uh, agnostic society. Uh, now, this is not a question of whether God is dead or whether God is not dead. It's a question of whether people act whether God is dead or whether God is not dead. And when people only go to, to the church or the temple or, or whatever the chapel, um, to, you know, just to get married or to uh, be born or, you know, on the, way, on the way out from the funeral parlour, if they only use the church or whatever for these functions and if they do not normally go to church and things like that, uh, this is different. Uh, almost every society that we can think of has had a very strong religious basis, a, a basis as strong as uh, its... Um, as, as its political base. We seem to be building a society that is political without any spiritual thing, any spiritual parallel. Now, I don't know whether this matters or not. I, I myself happen to be agnostic. But um, certainly, uh, organized religion in the times before us did play an enormous part in the lifestyle of the people. Now, what did people get out of religious or organized religion? Well, the first thing it, they got out of it was quite clearly some kind of spiritual comfort. Uh, nowadays, I suppose they can go to their, their shrink, their local neighborhood friendly psychiatrist, and lay down on the couch instead of going to the local rabbi or the priest or the minister or whatever, and at the way the rabbi, priest, or minister, or whatever charges, it may be a good deal. If the psychiatrist might be cheaper. But um, certainly, that kind of spiritual comfort can in some ways be ac accomplished. But there was something else that people got out of religion, and that was a sense of, com of communality, a sense of not standing alone, a sense of being with people, a sense of standing up and, and being counted. It's very interesting that every religion has a considerable degree of ritual to it. Uh, a considerable degree, people sing, people, uh, people, we even call them rites of passage, the important times of our lives. And not only are the, these rituals uh, concerned with uh, birth, marriage, and death, they are the, there is the daily ritual of religion, which seems to provide some kind of need. People are very, very lonely in, in the world. 
particularly at that time, that kind of solstice time of their life, when they suddenly realize, and it comes to, comes to some people quite early, so 35 sometimes, 40, that they have in fact lived longer than they are going to live. Uh, they are, they are a, a, a uh, space cruiser with only a certain amount of fuel, and they are on uh, a mission impossible. And this particularly uh, occurs to agnostics who know that, who feel probably that after they die, they've probably only got just one journey up the road to make. Uh, and these people seem to need that comfort, need, seem to need that comfort of communality much more than almost anyone else. Now, where can they get this? Well, I think one of the reasons why sports, spectator sports, have become so popular in this day and age, there are a number of reasons. One is the advent of television, the, the, the way that people are used to a, a passive approach to everything rather than a more active approach. I think that plays its very big part. The other, I think, is that people like to be in crowds occasionally. They get something out of it. I mean, why it would be much more easy to sit, in, sit at home and watch a game on television in the comfort of your own home with perhaps a few friends, a six-pack apiece, uh, uh, <laughs> or two six-packs, depends what your friends are like. Uh, and, um, and you have all the benefits of being at the game. You have, you have cameras, you have, you have instant replay, you have Howard Cosell. Uh, you, have, um, you have everything. And yet, in fact, people very often want to go to the game. They actually want to be there. And I think they want to be there because they want to mingle in this enormous crowd. Why were those rock concerts, the Woodstocks or the, or the Dillon concert at the, at the Isle of Wight, so enormously popular? I think that they were, to an extent, a, a kind of, of spiritual experience. I think that at the major rock, con rock concerts, even today, there seems uh, people do seem to have some kind of spiritual experience as well as anything else. And I think that in the theatre, you can also find this sense of ritual, this sense of being with the people, this sense of watching. I can foresee a time in which, and you can see signs of it coming, things like the, the uh, Robert Wilson's uh, experiments with time and staging in things, like the life, in, in things like the Life and Times of Joseph Stalin, a little play that lasted 12 hours and it was given at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It was 12 hours non-stop except for, except for breaks for donuts, as I remember. Uh, and I can see that in this, in this kind of, of experience, other, other kinds of, other weird kind of uh, forms of theatre are not weird necessarily, but different people are reassessing what the theatre does, They're reassessing of what a theatre should be. In the opinion of many theatre, um, many theatre um, um, architects and many theatre workers, what we think of as the theatre, fundamentally, the proscenium arch, is really only truly suitable for plays written in a comparatively short time from, say, the end of the 18th century to about, say, at the most, the middle of this century, a comparatively short, short time in space, uh, and given the length of the theatre, and that, indeed, this proscenium arch is really only suitable fundamentally for 19th-style uh, dramas and comedies, and for other plays, other forms are much more suitable. Uh, in the opinion of such people as Peter Hall, the director of Britain's National Theatre, and Peter Brook, um, all British directors are named Peter. Don't ask me why, I think it's a union. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but in the, the opinion of those people who are very advanced theatrical thinkers, they believe that the ideal theatre is a unit theatre which consists of nothing but an oblong box, nothing in it whatsoever. And you, know, you put seats in, you put the seating, and instead of... And this is something that's 